Hello, everybody. Welcome to Behind the Numbers Around the World, an e-marketer podcast brought to you by Vtex. It's Monday, July the 19th, and I'm your host, UK Principal Analyst Bill Fisher. And in this episode, we will be looking at how social media marketing is being kept in check. Welcome, one and all, to a Behind the Numbers show that takes you around the world looking at what other countries are doing in the worlds of commerce, media and advertising. Every month, we take a topic and ask a couple of our international experts to fill us in on what's happening in their markets. Today, we'll be heading to Northern Europe to find out about new legislation in Norway that will require social media influencers and marketers to disclose if they've manipulated images. But at the same time, I will say that there isn't, at least not yet, a lot of evidence to suggest that consumers, particularly young people, feel any better about themselves when they see an image with a disclaimer, because let's face it, they're seeing it anyway. Also in Europe, physically, if not politically, we'll be looking at the UK government's calls for social media platforms to better moderate content, following racist attacks on some of the England men's soccer team after their Euro 2020 final defeat. And then we'll head to South America, where we'll learn about how Argentina's consumer protection laws were recently flexed to counter some misleading claims from a skincare company. In Argentina, there isn't any particular law that requires influencers to use a hashtag to say that this is an ad. It kind of has that organic feel. So you, the viewer of the post or the social media user, are kind of just wondering, is this an ad? Is this not an ad? What's going on here? Okay, we're in Europe first, and I'm delighted to be joined from the currently unseasonably very hot Finland by our senior analyst for global trends and social media specialist to boot. It's Jasmine Emberg. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Bill. Hey, everyone. How are you coping? I'm hanging in there. It is warm, though. It, I just It's 33 degrees today, so not normal for Finland. You're used to saunas over there. Um, now, I don't want to increase the heat too much, but I've got a little test for you before we get onto the topic at hand. Oh, no. A, a nice little surprise. Um, <laughs> something new that I'm doing on each episode of Around the World is I'm introducing people to Britishisms, those words or phrases which we Brits understand, but elsewhere around the world, maybe not so much. Now, you're geographically quite close, so you, you stand a good chance here. I'm going to give you a word. Just have a guess if you know what it means. All right. Okay. So the word this month is chuffed. C-H-U-F-F-E-D. Chuffed. What does it mean, Jasmine? Delighted. Very good. Yeah, I knew you would. I to be fair, it. I have an advantage because I lived in London for a very long time. <laughs> and I bet London was chuffed to have you. Um, it does indeed. <laughs> it means thrilled to bits or delighted, but usually with no outward show of emotion because we are British after all. <laughs> um, so there you have it. If you're chuffed, you're quietly reserved or thrilled. The reason I'm mentioning this this week, well, the... English nation, as I mentioned in my intro, is in a pit of collective depression at the moment. Just over a week ago now, Italy defeated England in the men's European Championship final. That's the, I'm going to call it football. It's the football competition, aka soccer competition that Europe holds once every four years. Euro 2020, it was a year late because of the pandemic. But we got to the final. It was the first time, for, or the first major final we've been at for 55 years. It's, it's the biggest level of success I've ever seen for the team in my lifetime and beyond just that the team itself is made up of some remarkably good human beings which is quite a rarity for, for football teams. Several of them have used their platforms and often their social media platforms for good and they've taken on politicians and won and actually driven positive societal change. We'll talk about that in a bit. So yes, I'm rather down about the result, but I'm I'm chuffed to bits that we have this team representing us. Anyway, let's get on with social media and the ways in which governments and regulators are looking to make it an altogether healthier environment for people to be in. So Jasmine, I want to kick off by looking at this new legislation that's come into force in Norway about retouching photos. Why don't you give us the lowdown on that? What is it exactly? So basically, the new legislation states that social media ads that include content that has been retouched or otherwise manipulated to change the appearance of an individual need to now be labeled with a disclaimer. So that would include things like changing a person's body shape, body size, or their skin. 
And this legislation would apply to advertisers as well as influencers and social media content creators who promote products in their posts. So what has the feedback been like from, the, the, I suppose there's two groups there, from the influencer community and from the, the brands and the marketers? So I, I'd say it's been relatively mixed. There are many Norwegian influencers who have gone on the record to say that it's a step in the right direction and say that it will hopefully potentially encourage influencers to either edit their photos less or to be more real in the content that they produce. Now, there's also others that say it's kind of like slapping a Band-Aid on a larger problem, which, of course, are these unrealistic standards of beauty that are perpetuated throughout society and not just on social media. But I, I'd say at the very least, there seems to be an agreement that the legislation should promote more honesty on social platforms, which both brands and influencers are seeing as a good thing. And, and is there a, a youth aspect to this story? I, I saw in some of the PR around this story that it did mention sort of the online health or, or mental health of, of younger consumers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that young people are certainly the most vulnerable here. They're the most likely to be influenced by people and, and content they see on social media in both positive and negative ways, I might add. And there's tons of evidence to suggest that social platforms can contribute to mental health problems, eating disorders, and depression among young consumers. But at the same time, I will say that there isn't, at least not yet, a lot of evidence to suggest that consumers, particularly young people, feel any better about themselves when they see an image with a disclaimer, because let's face it, they're seeing it anyway. Ah, yes. That's a, that's <laughs> a really good point, actually. I hadn't considered that. I was going to talk all about the, the world happiness indexes and stuff like that, because <laughs> we all know how Scandinavian countries always rank very highly, but then they tend to have a relatively high rates of suicide, particularly amongst younger people. There are obviously m many other reasons for that. Finland is number I th one. I, th I, th I thought it was. So, so yeah, social media is likely going to have some kind of influence amongst younger demographics, right, in this regard, in, in terms of these statistics on depression and suicide. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's what this new legislation is trying to combat. Um, trying to promote more body positivity, trying to promote a healthier environment for young people online. Um, I think that's one of the key factors and one of the key reasons that they're trying or that they're passing this legislation. Why is it only passing now? What, why has it taken so long for Norway to get on board with this kind of thing? So actually, this isn't the first time that Norway has tried something like this. Back in 2016, uh, Trondheim, which I think is Norway's third largest city, banned billboards with images of Photoshop models. And as I was doing research for this podcast, I couldn't actually find whether or not that law is still in place, but there's definitely precedent for this kind of thing there. But going back to, you know, this new law for social media, which is the topic of this conversation, I will say I do think it is a big step forward for promoting body positivity and, and well-being. But I, I think the question and the reason I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about it is, how do you enforce it? For one, I, it includes filters, which are a common part of how people use social media today. And for sure, these new AR filters, whether they're on Instagram or on Snapchat, can significantly alter a person's appearance. But is adding sepia tone to an image really, quote unquote, retouching it? Um, I think the big question is, where do you draw the line? Yeah, I think drawing lines is going to be a recurring theme as we go through these stories. So actually, let's move on to your second story. It's in a similar vein, um, mm -hmm. albeit this one is a bit more global in nature. It relates to some news from Pinterest about weight loss ads. So what's happening there? So Pinterest has announced a new policy, which is effective as of July 1st, and that policy prohibits any ads with weight loss language or imagery. So that also includes things like testimonials about weight loss, language or imagery that denigrates certain body types or ads that reference weight indexes like BMI, as well as products that claim weight loss through something applied to the skin, which quite frankly, I didn't know existed before I read this. Brands can still promote healthy lifestyles and fitness products or services that don't focus on weight loss. And so for the record, Pinterest is the first and the only social platform that prohibits all weight loss ads now. Yeah, and that's that's what I think is interesting about this story. So this isn't regulators enforcing this. This mm -hmm. is the platform itself taking a stand. Why do you think Pinterest is on the front foot here? 
So Pinterest has been on the front foot of content moderation for quite some time. It was one of the, or it was the first platform actually in 2018 to ban political ads. It introduced a whole new slew of updates to how it polices political content around the US presidential election last year. It also banned anti-vax content in 2019. So I'm not entirely surprised that Pinterest is taking a stand here. The fact that it's coming from the platform, though, I think makes it an easier policy to enforce than the Norway legislation that we just talked about. There isn't as much gray area around what is allowed and what isn't. And ads that do violate this policy will be removed, just as other types of prohibited content are. Mm. We spoke about youth in the Norway story. Is there gender consideration at play in this story? So I think youth is a key factor here too, but I mean, considering Pinterest's heavily female user base, I think it goes without saying that gender is also a consideration in this case. And also a lot of the weight loss products on the market today are targeted toward young women, particularly young women, and the pressure to look a certain way falls a lot on young women as well. So yes, I would say gender is definitely at play here too. Yeah, you wonder, I mean, it, this is kind of ri- riding the zeitgeist of these kind of things at the moment. Is this piece of grandstanding from Pinterest. I'm, I'm being a bit harsh using that sort of terminology. <laughs> but but is it, you know, is this a one-off thing or are we going to see more and more of this kind of thing? It, either from Pinterest in terms of banning other types of ads or might we see other platforms doing similar things? So the social platforms pretty consistently update their ad policies. There was one time when we were trying to keep a running list of all the changes that Facebook was making and it got pretty unruly pretty quickly. I think this particular bad is coming at a time where both mental and physical health is a major concern for a lot of people. We're coming out of a pandemic and into a summer season when body image issues are at their highest anyway. I do think that we'll be seeing more of these kinds of policies going forward, particularly on visual platforms like Pinterest. And I'm talking about things like perhaps Instagram um, or TikTok. Yeah. And moderation, how, how you go about moderating is always an issue. And I mentioned that because I want to move into our third story now. And this, this brings us back to Europe, to the UK, in fact, and onto one of my favourite topics, football. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe lead the conversation on this one. This is a, it's slightly different to the other two. It's about some of the fallout from the Euro final loss and social media's role in that. So here's the story in brief. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, many England players are very active on social media. Um, I invite all of our listeners to, to go away and search up Marcus Rashford. He's one of the England strikers. He uses his platform and uses his social media platform for a, an awful lot of good. Last year during the pandemic, he almost single-handedly ran a campaign against the government to them, for them to reinstate free school meals for disadvantaged kids because they weren't getting them because they weren't in school. And he forced through that change on social media. Anyway, fast forward to a week ago. Three England players missed penalties in the penalty shootout. They were three black players. And immediately after the game, they faced some horrible racist messages across the social media platforms. Last week, Boris Johnson, the the Prime Minister in the UK, actually met with social media leaders to try and get them to do, he wants them to do better. He wants them to better moderate the content on their platform. So this is where the the issue comes in, right? How do social media platforms moderate their content? There must be some easy wins, right? So, I mean, I think this is such a great, also very sad example of something that's going on all the time in so many different parts of the world. And the question really is, who is responsible for the content on social media platforms? Does it fall on the users? Does it fall on the social platforms? Should it be the government that's regulating it? And it's not something that I think is going to be easily resolved. We're seeing this continue to play out, including in the US where, you know, they're talking about amendments to Section 230. So, you know, it's something that I think is going to continue to be in the news for a while, continue to be something that's up for for debate. Yeah, you mentioned, should the government be involved? A slight nuance to this story (laughs) is is that throughout the tournament, before kickoff, the England team were taking a knee um, to show solidarity with the BLM movement. And during the early matches in the tournament, some as well a small section but some england supporters were actually booing that action some very prominent government ministers 
front bench ministers also took to social media to, if not support the booing, they certainly voiced their opinion that it's a free country. And if people wanted to boo this gesture politicking, which is I'm doing in inverted commas uh, here, they were free to do so. So for a government to kind of stoke the fires of division and then on the other hand, should they be in charge of moderating these platforms? You know, you can begin to see where problems arise. I mean, what, one extra thing I would add is that the UK is in the midst of implementing its online harms bill. But th this has been in the works for quite a while now. I think it was early last year when it was originally penned. Only last week it was published and then it will have to go into Parliament to be debated. So it's unlikely to come into force until later this year or, or early next. So, you know, moderation of social media platforms. How do we do it? I don't know. Uh, answers on a postcard. Anyway, thank you very much, Jasmine. It was really great to catch up with you. Some really interesting stuff happening in Europe with regard to social media and how platforms are having to work harder at getting better in that regard. We're going to take a quick break now to hear from our sponsor, and then I'll be back with my next guest. Well, we'll be heading to Latin America for a bit before circling back to Europe again. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtex, vtex.com slash emarketer to learn more. Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to take a metaphorical long haul flight to South America, and I'm delighted to be joined by our senior analyst for Latin America and Spain, Mateo Savells. Hi, Mateo. Hey, Bill. Great to be here. It's great to have you on the show again. You have a couple of stories for us today, Mateo. I would start in Argentina with some news around the consumer protection laws there, which have been around for a while, but which recently got some attention due to some questionable marketing messages. What's the story about this? Yes. So anyone that has been to Argentina, has worked in Argentina, knows it's a very bureaucratic environment. So there are plenty of laws abound to keep up with. So, But for in this instance, it's actually a good law, in my opinion. I think it's holding brands responsible. But recently, a uh, cosmetic and skincare company, New Skin, made shockwaves in the news when they were fined about $30,000 for what was noted as misleading advertising. Basically, the company had breached law 240 um, that violate the consumer protection law by not providing truthful, clear, and quote, detailed information about its products. So basically, the gist of it was that the, pro the company had put forth this notion that the product would make you youthful, that would make you, you know, these very hyperbolic claims that this was the secret to a long life of beauty and success, which then obviously got denounced and then they received the fine for that. So it was really one of the more publicly made headlines in the country. Was it a big fine? I mean, if you're a multinational, 30,000 is a slap on the wrist. If you're a regular, mm. you know, Argentine company, I mean, that's a, it's a chunk of change. So we'll go with, yes, I'd say a sizable for the country. But I think if you're a, a global brand, it's a little drop in the bucket, I'd say. Yeah. Tell me about the role of social media and particularly influencers in this story, because that's mm -hmm. a key issue, isn't it? Definitely. So like many brands, and especially within the beauty space, they leverage social media to promote their products and promote these claims. And I think, you know, for when influencers are used properly, they can do really a lot of good in, in promoting very positive brand sentiment. However, in certain cases, they could also negatively perpetuate certain beauty standards, ideals. And in this case, you know, the company did use influencers to post on social media, most notably Instagram, and promoting the same bottom line of this eternal beauty concept. So that's how they leveraged it. And that was really problematic because in Argentina, there isn't any particular law that requires influencers to use a hashtag to say that this is an ad. It kind of has that organic feel. So you, the viewer of the post or the social media user, are kind of just wondering, is this an ad? Is this not an ad? What's going on here? But 
At the moment, there is nothing on the books, but that will make influencers uh, disclose that it's actually hashtag advertising or something of the sort. So is the impetus on, on consumers just to recognize it? It's not, it's not really policed in any way. Correct. It's, uh, it is unfortunately on the consumer to recognize these things and do a little bit of self-policing. And if something does look a bit out of sorts or something does look very retouched or promoting something that goes against what the laws would state or what you know goes against consumer sentiment, then yeah, it's up to the consumer to police it at the moment. But you know that does broaden the scope of you know what is the role of social media? Where is that role of free speech and free idea versus censorship and policing? And especially in Latin American markets where you've had a history of dictatorship and censorship, it's a very it's a little bit more of a finer line and a little tighter uh, rope to walk. So it's a bit more delicate than I'd say in other parts of the world. Yeah, it comes back to that theme of moderation that that Mm -hmm. Jasmine and I were just talking about. Yeah, interesting. In in Jasmine's stories, we looked at some of the demographic angles. Is is there a a demographic angle to this story or the particular genders, age, diversity, involvement in this story? Yes and no. And I think in part, yes, obviously the platforms with which this type of content would appear, I would say would skew more on the younger side. If Instagram users in Argentina generally tend to skew a bit younger in age. But I think it's a broader issue more in general. I'd say out of all the Latin American countries, Argentina has been one of the more progressive ones in terms of promoting social issues that they were one of the first, for instance, to legalize gay marriage. They have a lot of big you know, social and progressive agendas. But I think it also just goes back to the general concept that consumers are a bit more aware and sensitive to these types of things. For instance, in one of the analyst takes I wrote, we were looking at kind of representation in ads. And especially in Argentina, one of the more notable things was that consumers that were polled in Argentina believed that a person's physical characteristics or skin color actually subjected them to greater levels of discrimination. So there is a sensitivity to how one's look, one's appearance is actually translating into some sort of some levels of discrimination in the country. And that's, you know, that's just broadly society wide. And it's not just something that's pertinent to Argentina. It's across several countries in Latin America. And I'd say even across the world, we're all subjected to these standards of beauty. And then that begs the the larger question, really, what is beauty? What is this ideal? And whose version of it is right? And whose version of it is wrong? Coming back to the idea of self-moderation again, folks in Latin America are pretty adept at using social media, right? I was just looking at some data from Global Web Index, top 10 countries ranked by average daily time spent using social media. In the top 10, we have Brazil, we have Colombia, we have Mexico, and we have Argentina, all in the top 10. So, you know, you guys, you're always on the platform. You should be able to spot all this stuff. Um, (laughs) Let's move on to the next story. And we're heading full circle now back to Europe, which is where we began this podcast. Um, We'll start with Spain, actually, particularly, where legislation is, let's say, a little bit further behind than in some other countries when it comes to things like image alterations in marketing, which we were talking about with um, some of the earlier stories. We're going back just a few years, but tell me about Ima Cuesta and tell me if I've butchered that. Not pronunciation you got it well. good. You got it so. good. No, he says. So Spain does and does not. There are some advertising laws on the book that were actually enacted in the 80s and 90s. However, there's no real current one in the sense of like Norway or in the sense of France that has an actual like in the title or even in Argentina too, this anti-Photoshop law. So Spain has different consumer protection laws and, consu- and advertising laws. However, they in the modern age, they need a little bit of finessing in order to be applied to this digital age. So that's kind of where we now get into these gray areas. So back in 2015, actress Ima Cuesta, it was a big stir in the country. She posted on her Instagram account that one of her photos that she had appeared in was very much retouched and she was very upset by it because she did not realize, I mean, she couldn't even recognize herself in it. Now, it sparked then that broader conversation of digital retouching. And because Spain's laws are a little out of step with what's currently happening, there were some ways you could apply some of these different advertising laws to the issue at hand. But at the same time, then if it's whoever owns the photo, so do you, the model, own your photo or does the person commissioning said photo or the agency commissioning said photo own the rights to that photo. So it becomes this like back and forth of who owns the rights to say, to make those decisions. She had posted on her account. She said, here's the photo where I appeared in and here's the same exact photo I took on my mobile phone. 
And now you can definitely see there was a bit of like finessing, retouching, a bit of body uh, reconfiguration to make it appear more slender. But she's like, I understand that if you want to emphasize maybe the blue in the dress or emphasize different parts of it, maybe do a little touch up here and there. Totally fine. But when you actually start modifying people's bodies, that's where it becomes a bit of the broader issue. So given obviously her clout, social clout, it was definitely something that was brought into the the headlines of some of the big news outlets there. But it definitely begs the broader question of, you know, these, again, beauty standards, and especially for famous people that do have these large networks of people and influence over certain select groups of consumers. You know, this type of negative publicity or type of criticism can definitely impact, you know, whatever campaign that they're working on. So in the sense of being an influencer, you can definitely do good with your social power, as well as you could also do serious brand damage as well if your influencer is very unhappy with how that arrangement is working out. Yeah, and it's a really interesting story because coming back to that moderation piece again, where regulation doesn't step in this is a case of self moderation by the subject um, which is quite interesting and that leads us on to a a related story in the UK doesn't it tell me about Kate Winslet in the UK doing something similar yes so another I'd say a good example of that where celebrities or people of influence are stepping into the realm would be Kate Winslet in the UK For instance, she had, when she was working on her deal with Lancome, one of the stipulations in her contract was that any pictures taken of her cannot be digitally retouched, that she's going to be shown just as she is. And in doing so, she had considered that, you know, she as a woman has a duty to then to make a, you know, you leverage her, I'd say femininity, leverage her influence to say, no, like I'm going to be in the spotlight. I'm going to be seen by countless number of people both women and even men i'd say too but you know this is how i am a woman of my age that looks a certain way you're not going to be perfectly smooth skin beautiful brilliant um, shimmering glow it's just unrealistic and i think that's a really it was a good step on her part to say you know listen if you want to work with me and leverage my network of influence then these are my stipulations because we as a society need to have these discussions to say that you know, we are all responsible for raising the next generation of people. And then what are these ideals that we want to leave on or leave with them? Yeah, it, you know, it's quite timely. It, over here in the UK, this week, pandemic restrictions are being fully lifted in the UK. And the advice from the government or, or the position from the government, I should say, is that the impetus is on us as a society to do the right thing, to to keep ourselves safe. So rather than them being the heavy-handed big brother telling us everything that we must do, they're giving us the leeway to do what we think is right. And these are some of the stories that I'm hearing coming out from the the things that we've been discussing today. Moderation on social media regulation is really hard. And where you can empower users, influencers to do some of that self-moderation, looks like one of the ways that we can maybe have a small win. Okay, well, that's all we have time for today on Behind the Numbers Around the World, brought to you by VTEX. Thanks to my guests, Jasmine and Matteo, and thanks to all of you for listening. I hope you'll all be back next month for our next edition. I would be dead chuffed if you did return. If you want to ask us any questions, you can, of course, email us at podcast at emarketer.com. Marcus will be back with you tomorrow with the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast brought to you by VTEX. He hopes to see you there.